I was born in Ghana. Yes. My mother was born in Ghana. Right. My mother's mother was born in Ghana. Okay. But actually, my father was born in Barbados. Right. He moved to Trinidad when he was a baby. So he grew up in Trinidad. His father was a tailor. And my father knew that if he was going to get a, a good education, he had to be bright. So he won scholarship. He won something called the Ireland Scholarship. He went to Queen's Royal College in Trinidad in Port of Spain. He won the Ireland Scholarship, which enabled him to be sent to come to university in Britain. He studied at, first of all, Edinburgh University, then U University College of Dublin. He studied medicine. He became a doctor in 1925. He practiced in the East End of London, in Walthamstow. In fact, on Monday, there's going to be a blue plaque unveiled to my father in Walthamstow, outside the house where he used to live in between 1926 and 1929. In 1929, he went to Ghana, and he practiced in the rural areas. Uh, he was there for 50 years, and so that was the trajectory of his life. And my mother's father was born in Dominica, and he came to Britain in 1899. He studied law. He was a delegate at the first Pan-African Conference in London in 1900, and he went to Ghana in 1902. And he lived there till he died in 1940, I believe. And so, you know, I am from a lot of places, although I am from Ghana. And I connect with a lot of different places. I have family in a lot of different places. We all do. We're all connected in one way or another. So I'm Ghanaian, but I have a world view, if you like. We have to open our minds. There's a whole world out, of the, out there that we can be learning from be influenced by, be contributing to, and that, that to me is what's important. The world is a, is a very difficult place sometimes, very scary sometimes. At the moment it's, it's very weird, and we have to see how we can help make it a better place, support each other as women, mm -hmm. as people from Africa, as people from different parts of the world, wherever we are. We are each the center of our own world, but we can reach out to anybody in some way. And writing literature is a way that you can connect with people. You don't know who your reader is going to be, but you can have an influence on their life by what you read or what you compile in an anthology or any of those things. So we, we're all able to impact on other people's lives to greater or lesser extent in everything we do on a daily basis. If you just go down the street and smile at somebody, that could be important for their life. And it can have a positive impact, and it was so easy to do. Right. So how important do you think it is to look beyond geographical or national or ethnic borders and come together, especially in the case of uh, women writers of African descent? You know, for me, the way this anthology has come about is an example of the way that women of African descent have come together. There's a sisterhood. I saw no divisions in the way people, including this, this anthology, saw each other. I think what happens quite often is that people are put into a sort of con confrontational position by the wider society because they're competing with other, they're being made to compete with each other. I mean, last year when I was doing, when the, the New Doors of Africa anthology came out, I, I was doing um, various um, panels on, at literary festivals and I, I was, each time there were a different combination of, of contributors and some of them said things which were sad and saddening, but that's the way things were impacting on their lives. There was one writer I was speaking to who said she'd been going to have a feature in a national newspaper, mm -hmm. who at the last minute decided they couldn't do it because they'd already had a feature by somebody else too similar, similar to her, you know, a black African Muslim woman, you can't have two of them. Into, so that is what's happening quite often. You know, some, one, one person is made to represent everybody. And so, of course, you know, if you're going to have one, people go, one person going through that door, maybe there's going to be 
rivalry about who's going to be that person. Why should there be? And I think that is why we have to also see the importance in being involved, not only from the point of view of being writers, but being part of the machinery that publishes, part of the machinery that reviews, part of the every part aspect of the literary production process, so that we're, we're not competing with each other. We don't have to, because somebody else is saying, well, I only have one of you. I've already got, I'm, I'm an agent, I've got, I want black, one black African writer. If, if I've got you, I don't want her. That's the problem. So we need to have more of us in those other parts of the industry so that we are not segregated, we're not being pitted against each other. We don't feel that somebody else is taking up our place because we, we are making our own place in the world. We're, we're validating ourselves. We're not waiting for somebody else to say, well, we'll have you but not her. We don't need to do that. We don't need to do that. That's very, very powerful. Yes, because I like to think about, not like you said, it's not just about what you write, it's about who publishes it and who opens the door, keeps it shut, really. And I think um, you, having been a publisher, and the nature of your, the work you do, and by nature of who you are, right, um, has made such an impact. And I think that's part of the reason why so many people um, look up to you, including myself. And um, because I can only imagine how difficult it must have been at the time to break into an industry um, that does not generally like to accept n not even new people, new ideas, anything new that is a little bit mm -hmm. outside um, of what we call the norm, even though I don't know <laughs> how normal, you know, uh, something so homogenous is. Mm. <laughs> but um, could you tell us a little bit about your career as a publisher and how you got into it and what, what you experienced? How did I get into publishing? Well, I suppose throughout my life I've always been interested in the written word, reading, writing, books, mm -hmm. literature. And I, I went to university in England, in London University, at Bedford College. I read English. <laughs> I never read a black writer or an African writer in my curriculum. I, I, I found African writers and black writers outside, whether it was the Heinemann African Writer Series or African writers uh, or, or African American writers who were then and as Negro writers. So I, I educated myself in black writing as well as having my traditional English education with whether it's Shakespeare or Milton or Chaucer, all those classics, those greats. So I was aware of what I was missing. And when I was still at university, I met somebody. I, I was involved with my college literary magazine and, and involved with writing poetry myself. And there was a friend of mine called Rachel Anderson who was having her first novel published. I'd known her from my school days and she was having a party. She was also getting engaged. So I was invited as a friend of hers and her fiance invited people he knew, his friends, people he was at university with. And there was this uh, um, person I was introduced to who was also doing things um, at his literary magazine, at his college um, literary magazine and publishing things called Clive Allison and we talked about what we might do when we graduated and you know we thought, both of us had thought publishing was an option so we said why don't we start a publishing company? <laughs> so this was an idea that we had before we'd, either of us had even graduated and I, I, I graduated when I was 20 so that's how much I knew about the world. Mm -hmm. And so we, we eventually we met up again after we both graduated and we started publishing. And we found out about things as we went along. And we started with three cheap poetry books in paperback because we thought poetry ought to be cheap and available for mm -hmm. young people like ourselves. So that's where we started. We had no distribution. We sold the books however we could, knocking on doors, stopping people in the street. And um, we both had to get, uh, I, I, I was married to, at that point, to a jazz musician. Um, Clive, was he married? Anyway, we had to get jobs um, 
to earn money. So I was doing lots of different jobs. I, we were doing, I got a job in a publishing company called the Crescent Press, um, editorial assistant. Clive was working with other publishing companies. Um, well, my jazz musician husband was not earning very much, so <laughs> I was also, I had a program on the BBC African service uh, called Break for Women. So I was, we were sort of living hand to mouth, working around the clock, trying to make ends meet, also finding out about the industry as we went along. And the first novel we published was a novel called The Spook Who Sat By The Door, the Spook Who Sat By The Door, by an African-American writer called Sam Greenlee, who had been pointed in my direction by a friend of my husband's, who'd bumped into Sam on a Greek island, and Sam has been trying to find a publisher, and nobody had wanted his novel on either side of the Atlantic, and so, Sam came to see me, I borrowed some money so he could stay in London, I could work on the manuscript with him. And then we decided this is going to be our first full-time novel. So Clive Allison and I both left our jobs and The Spooker Sat by the Door became our first full-time book. We got it serialised in The Observer, or not serialised, The Observer colour magazine did extracts because we sent them the manuscript saying, would you like to extract this? And they sent it back saying, you ought to know we don't do that sort of thing with fiction and we wouldn't do it with this black power no novel. <laughs> but we didn't know any better, so we sent it back to them and said, listen, you're wrong. And they ended up doing it. So we were finding our way as we went along and that's, that's what happened. Mm -hmm. And it, we didn't come to publishing from any standpoint of having done courses or any experience of life. And we just went on and published things that we believed in, things that nobody else was doing. In fact, somebody once said to me about uh, the company, about Alison and Busby, you never knew what Alison and Busby was going to do next, but you, we knew it was going to be interesting. <laughs> So we were, we were publishing things we believed in, we bumped into authors in the pub or wherever, and we, and we published them. We brought people back into print who were out of print. Celia James, who had been at school with my father and is a, a world-renowned historian, was out of print. So we reprinted him. I, I did three collections of s selected writings by him, found writers who I mean, one of the writers that um, I edited, who was an edi uh, uh, one of our leading writers, was um, Buchia Meshita, who was, you know, she, like me, was a young African woman in London, and we published her, and uh, you know, so we were doing things that chimed with what we believed in, with our ideals, not only black writers, Clive was not black, uh, I was, and so I think there was a lot of well, looking at the press cu cuttings now, you can see that I was being treated as some sort of freak. You know, the girl from Ghana goes into publishing. It was, you know, as if they were saying, you know, black girl can read. <laughs> so it was, you know, but we, you know, we were focused on what we were doing. So it wasn't a question of me worrying about what people felt about me. Although it was quite obvious that people assumed that when you have two people working together, one is a white man, one is a black woman, who do they think is in charge? Mm -hmm. So everybody from the window cleaner to the bank manager assumed that I was just there to make the tea or that he was the boss. The window cleaner used to say, can you get your boss to pay me? I'd say, yeah, he's next door. So those, that was the society we were part of and that's, that's what I was used to. And I just got on with what I was doing. So. Mm -hmm. Things have changed now, they're perhaps not so overtly um, seeing me as a freak, but I, I suppose I was a freak to that extent. You make what you have achieved sound so easy, almost trivial. I'm at once so inspired and so intimidated. I just <laughs> talk about it as if, oh, you know, we just started. Well, the thing is, uh, it was just like that. <laughs> when, when, when you're young, you, you don't know, first of all, you don't know what can go wrong. You don't have lots of dependents or mortgages or things that you might think, well, I can't do X or Y because of some other reason. You, 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 your needs are probably uh, not as great as they become as you go on, and, and you don't have anything to compare it with. And when, when we were starting out, we had no office, so we had... Our office was the flat of a, a friend of Clive's in Soho. 
so we, you know, we covered. If the if the landlord came around, we had to pretend the desk was, you know, having a tea party. Not wasn't an office. Oh, <laughs> so you know, and and uh, I think we had about a thousand pounds a year to split three ways. So some weeks you got seven pounds, some weeks you got six pounds. So you know, it was all pretty hand to mouth. We didn't know any better. We we borrowed money from friends, but we could. And but we actually we made we made. Um, Progress from book to book. We sold rights, translation rights. The Spook Who Sat by the Door, our first novel, we sold in translation to Italy, France, Holland, Germany, Japan. We sold lots of translation rights. We sold paperback rights. It became a cult movie. It was filmed. It, it was actually suppressed. It, it was a sort of. It's still relevant, The Spook Who Sat by the Door. The story behind that was that. The CIA decide that they need to, they haven't got any black people working for them, so they need to show that they are diverse. Mm -hmm. And so they employ this black man, he gets all the best training, he is the spook who sat by the door, so everybody can see they've got a black employee. And he meanwhile um, works with the freedom fighters in Chicago in a subversive way. So it's, it's, it's again about diversity. So here we are in 2020 still talking about diversity, companies who still feel the need to show, yes, we've got some black employees. Well, that's fine. But the point is, you don't need to make a song and dance about it in order to say, look how good we are. Look, we're employing some diverse people, some people who are not like ourselves, who are black or working class or female or disabled. You, you're not doing it to shine a light on yourself, say, look how clever, how virtuous we are. You're doing it because it's the right thing to do and it's going to enrich everybody, enrich literature as a whole if you're having the input from all these different perspectives. You don't want just one perspective on life or literature. You want a variety. That's what makes it rich.